No role plays, no conference calls, no BS. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Hey everyone, this is Chris. And Lorenzo. And welcome to our Best of Saturday series. Now that we have hundreds of episodes, we get a lot of listeners asking us where to start. So we'll be selecting some of our most popular episodes to share each Saturday from our years of podcasting. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, on this episode, I want to talk about having a common enemy. Mm, okay, okay. Kind of, a, kind of a weird topic when it comes to leadership. You would think, what do you mean, a common enemy? Um, some of our listeners are probably old enough to remember where they were when 9-11 happened. And one of the things that I remember in the aftermath of 9-11 for a few months is that there was a precipitous drop in crime, um, you know, property crime, violent crime in amongst the people of the United States. And it was largely attributed to this idea of having a common enemy that for, for a certain point in time, we all kind of decided that there was some, uh, there was a force or an enemy that was greater than all of us that that if we didn't work together to defeat, that uh, that it was going to defeat us. And and it started making people look at each other as on the same team as opposed to inherently on a different team. Um, people looked uh, looked across, you know, the different uh, demographics that they would normally not be on the same team as. And it was kind of like this interesting moment in time that I think a lot of good came out of. And I, I was kind of unfortunate when it when I think it kind of went away. Um, but I see this in a lot of leadership teams too. And here's what, I'll give you a perfect example. I'm consulting for an organization right now where there are some changes that need to happen. There are some some kind of like long-standing things that they've, they've always been kind of against the rules, but they've been allowed to happen over time, almost like how if the speed limit's 65, you drive 72, you know? And, and if all of a sudden, you started getting a, it makes sense you'd get a speeding ticket at 90, but if all of a sudden people started getting tickets at 66 instead of 65, there'd be this like outrage, like, what? I've been doing this for the longest time, right? So um, when it comes to making changes like this on a leadership team, what I'm experiencing or witnessing right now is the leadership team kind of collectively decided that there was a person who would be better at kind of making these changes. And, and, and what, what, what it was basically is that that person was kind of okay at delivering hard feedback. Um, you know, they, they are kind of viewed already as a person who was, has less empathy, easier to have those tough conversations. And then you have the, the rest of the leadership team who doesn't like having those tough conversations. And so they get that, that person gets anointed to kind of like take the charge. And I'm seeing how it might work in the short term, but there could be some long-term negative implications on this. Um, for this for this team, but it happens across the workforce. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Have you have you ever seen this kind of this this uh, this theory of the uh, um, the common enemy play out in a, in a leadership team? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think any like dynamic of a group or a team, um, there's always going to be those that are um, are more aligned in certain aspects, and there will be those that are that have a different perspective or a different way of approaching things. And I think when you're when you're thinking about building teams. Uh, with with you know diverse backgrounds, experiences, perspectives, things like that. Like that's actually a part of the expectation is that there will be people that are more comfortable with certain aspects of the job and the role um, than others, and and maybe more experienced with it and more capable of delivering things. But I think what ends up happening in a lot of teams though is that you know there may be this common trait of you know may, maybe you have outgoing personalities on your team. You have a lot of people that kind of walk in to rooms with a lot of energy and positivity and and how's things going? How was your weekend? And, you know, they're really, really kind of out outgoing in that aspect. Yeah, type A. Yeah. Type A, right? Yep. Versus another leader who might walk in and just say, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And just keep walking. And and it's not that they don't have the same type of, of, of you know, want or need or curiosity or connection. It's just that that's who they are and their approach. And if you just look on the surface of those two things, you may say something like, oh, wow, like, you know, Chris walks in every day and he's just so positive and he's got this energy and he says hi and he stops and he talks to me for 30 seconds and he keeps it moving and it's so awesome. We love him. Lorenzo walks in and he just waves and says hi and keeps going on about his day. And like, I'll talk to him later, but he doesn't, you know, it's different. It's different when he's here. It's a different environment. It's a different vibe. 
in like, yeah, that that that's actually that can happen. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, that that I am I'm doing something wrong or that um, I have to show up the same way that Chris does. But over time, if that doesn't change, over time, if there doesn't if there's not some type of a a little bit of a middle ground, if if Chris doesn't um, figure out ways to make sure that he's not only positive and energetic and bringing this element, but he's also making sure that he's balancing that with maybe harder conversations or or accountability. If Lorenzo doesn't stop and pause and start to build relationships in his own way and maybe doesn't walk in with a whole bunch of energy, but spends more time connecting with people while they're on the floor or on the job or in the office, like actually building quality relationships. If those things don't happen, there becomes this kind of a very clear divide in styles and and I think that can cause people to say like, well, when when Chris is here, it's one way. When Lorenzo here, it's a different way. And we like Chris's style more than Lorenzo's style. So therefore, Lorenzo may not be a great leader, or or we we may have feedback, and we may feel a certain way about him. So in your example, like that person who is good at or is okay with delivering tough uh, conversations or feedback or coaching. If they constantly volunteer for that work, they may find themselves as the common enemy because they're the only ones giving that type of dialogue to the team. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I, I think that the, the interesting part about your example is that it could just as easily be decided that Lorenzo is the good leader and Chris isn't because the team is the kind of person – the, the, the team that you're dealing with are the kind of people who, when Chris walks in all energetic and happy and positive, <laughs> that the response is, oh, why is he all, always so energetic and positive? Like yeah, exactly. I like it when Lorenzo's here better. He just leaves me alone, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And and so there, this, isn't a, this isn't an indictment on one type of leadership skill or another. This is that, that no matter who you are as a person, you will find yourself – gravitating towards one type or the other. And so when it comes to teams with multiple leaders, this is where it can become a problem. If the buck stops with one person, if you if you have one boss and you don't have a team of leaders or you're not a leader of leaders, this is less likely to happen because at the end of the day, you have that one, you have that one boss and you kind of have to deal with that. But when you have situations like in our background in terms of a retail environment where you could have a person who is a an individual contributor or a line level employee and depending on the day, they may have one of three or six or ten different leaders that they are working with or dealing with, they will absolutely have a hierarchy. They will be able to in in a in a 30 second period be able to organize the list of all their leadership names from their favorite to their least favorite. And, and there will be, there will be one or two that is a very easily top and one or two very easily at the bottom. And the rest might be a little bit more difficult to kind of fall into the middle or they're kind of like inconsequential to that person in that person's mind. But I think in a lot of leadership teams, the reason why this is likely to happen is because we see one inherent value in diversity of leadership style, right? If, if all the leaders are exactly the same, then they'll find themselves resonating with some employees, but not all employees. And that's a good way to disengage some employees. If there's a variety, if there's different leaders that have different styles or different ways of doing things, the collective of them is likely to make sure that every employee has a leader that they find themselves being able to gravitate towards. And that can seem really um, like, like a positive and, and it is a positive, but it underscores the importance of having a baseline of certain skills and certain leadership um, qualities that everybody has to bring to the table. The, 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 the leader that I'm talking about who is better or doesn't mind delivering the tough conversations, that doesn't mean the rest of that leadership team is off the hook from having to deliver those tough conversations because that, that means that the the per, the person who is delivering all the conversations is going to be viewed at as the bad leader by anybody who doesn't like hearing tough feedback and the rest of the team gets off the hook they get to remain with the the, the best friends with the team with with the rest of the uh the employees and not feel like they're hurting their relationship with them all while getting the benefits of the accountability that comes from this this mm-hmm. peer of theirs who kind of like you know falls on their sword and i say falls on their sword intentionally because at the end of the day that's what will happen that that leader 
who ends up being the one who is delivering those tough conversations will be the one who is ousted by the team as not a good leader when in actuality um, it, the rest of the team probably should have stepped it up too. Yeah, and I think there's elements of that where where it gets confusing or becomes a gray area is that that same style of of directiveness or clarity or accountability or that type of thing, a lot of people actually appreciate that over time. Mm-hmm. So like like what they appreciate is that you're not beating around the bush. You know, it's it's you're not you're not trying to sugarcoat anything. And 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 then they realize that when they take that and then they maybe put into action some of the feedback or the behaviors, they become more successful. That many times they will really appreciate that leader. Um, the the kicker as to what you underlined was like the larger team collectively though. It's the difference between leaders that the leadership team really gets judged upon. So like mm. if, if you have a collection of leaders um, as, as a larger team looking at them, when you hear things like they're not aligned, they don't communicate well, um, they, they don't, you know, they, they, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in the environment when some leaders are here, some leaders are there. What, what a larger team is looking at is the delta and variance between each leader and how they show up collectively for those, for those individuals. So if, if, if you and I are on the same team and you and I are really clear about a message or we approach the work the same way or even though we come with different ideas and different perspectives, we know that this thing we should be relatively consistent with and how we, how we handle it, how we deal with it. And then there's another leader over here that's a little bit up and down or, or doesn't do the same exact thing that we do or they feel like they're not on the same page they're not informed as well whatever the case is from a team perspective they say the leadership team is not aligned right because there's a difference in in how we're approaching certain things now the reality is there's always going to be differences there should be and there's always going to be ways that we handle things or approach things in a different way what what, I, what i'm talking about though are, are kind of like the things that should be relatively consistent. When we make a decision to do something in regards to a client or a customer um, or an exception, things like that, like we should be relatively in the same ballpark about how we handle that and then how we go about making the decision. Um, and if, we are, if we're good with that, then I think that that's very, very helpful. It's when you have a leader or somebody who says, eh, I would do that, but that's a lot more work. Or I would do that, but I really don't want to have to spend the time figuring that thing out. I'm going to take the easy route and make right. this call versus other leaders who are doing the work. That's when you start to run into trouble, and that's when the team starts to say, wait a minute, they're not aligned, they're not consistent. Right, right. And and when it comes to holding people accountable, that can be a, a really, really big deal because if there is a, a large enough percentage of the employee base that just doesn't that, that in general just views accountability towards getting the job done as inherently negative meaning that they're being held accountable to a result or to a to a certain behavior that 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 maybe doesn't um come naturally to them you know something where they have to actually work at to get this part of their job done it, it means that now the job is more than just I just show up and, and do whatever the basic minimum is and still get paid and and, I'm, and everything's fine. Now I have to actually change something about myself or change something about my the way I show up or my behavior, and that doesn't inherently feel good. So instead of taking that and going, all right, let's see what I can do to make this change or make this difference, I now say, all right, well, I need to make sure that I make this change or this difference when this leader is around but when the other lead parts of leadership team are around, that doesn't matter as much. And and that's where the problem happens. If, if, if there are five people who are on the same leadership team and they want to de- all collectively decide to delegate the accountability to the one leader who has an easier time or, or doesn't mind having the tough conversations, if the delivery of the conversation, that, the one-on-one conversation that says this thing needs to change is done by one person – by itself, that isn't inherently a negative thing, but the follow-up on the behaviors needs to be lockstep, meaning the next time that a person who didn't have that conversation witnesses the same behavior happening, that person is you know pulls the employee aside and says, hey, I, I know that you had this conversation with this person. Um, I just want to know, like, talk to me about what, what happened there, what, what happened there or why it, why it was different. What that does is, is it says, oh, they talk to each other. Like, oh my gosh, those, yeah, but that, that is a good thing. You don't necessarily have to be the best at delivering the tough conversation to make this work out. You can work as a leadership team to figure out who uh, can work with their strengths to do the delivery or to do this, this element of it. It's the general impression about what does the team feel 
about the leadership team as a whole? And, and do they see weaknesses in the armor? Do they see places in, in the, in the chain mail they can poke holes through to kind of separate out? Cause that's what they will do. They will, they will naturally find those, those holes and they will, they will separate the, the team. And eventually what will happen is the leadership team will start becoming resentful towards each other because of the feeling of, of, of a lack of alignment that they actually brought on themselves. Absolutely. So let me ask you a question, because as we've been talking about this, I've been in my own head thinking about a time when maybe I was the common enemy. So was there ever a time in your career where you would say, like, you know what, there's a good chance that at that point I may have been the common enemy? Yeah, so um, I, I can think of, and, and, and I did this the wrong way. Um, I, 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 I was looked at as a positive force on a, on a team of people. And instead of using that to talk to my peers on a leadership team and say, this is what I'm hearing, this is what I'm seeing, I would love to know your feedback too. Let's figure out where I'm lacking that, and let's figure out where you're lacking and let's get together. Instead, I, I kind of um, embraced that as like, oh, I'm the one that, that people like. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, I wasn't necessarily bad mouthing my peers but I was kind of allowing the relationship to deteriorate between the employees and my peers in a way that made me feel like, all right, if it came down to it, like a, you know, vote somebody off the island survivor style, I'll be the last, I'll be the last one voted off. And I looked at that as like kind of a, a positive thing, not even realizing that the, maybe the reason why they are, are looking on me positively is not because of something I'm good at, but rather something I'm not good at that they don't like either. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is absolutely a double-edged sword. And because everybody kind of naturally gravitates towards the things that they are good at, it can be difficult to see your own blind spots in the moment. And so that's why it's just, it's incredibly important to have this um, uh, an amazing communication rhythm when it comes to people who are peers on the same leadership team, because there will be a lot of interactions that occur when you're not around. You're, if you're if it, if you're not the only leader and you have peers, you can't rely on that. The 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 only delivery of leadership, of accountability, of praise, of of all these things isn't just siloed through you. There's a lot of people who are going to be doing this, and and inconsistencies will be picked apart. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us this episode's one minute hack. But first, a few words from our sponsors. The One Minute Hack. All right, for this episode's One Minute Hack, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down four words on a piece of paper. I want you to write down positivity, accountability, competence, and recognition. And then I want you to think about the leaders that you either report up to or that are on your, your peer team. If you're on a, on a team of leaders or if you're a leader of leaders, the people who report up to you, I want you to write down the names of the people on those, on those teams who you think would be are known for each of those things, the competence, positivity, accountability, th those, write down those names. If you're able to do that fairly easily, that means that there is likely a common enemy on your team. There's likely a person who is viewed at as the, the one that no one wants to be around because they only hold people accountable. Um, you're, you're likely to have a person on your team who people might enjoy being around, but maybe they're not good at holding people accountable. All of those things can, can drive wedges between your leadership teams. And that means that you need to sit down with your peers or the people who report to you or there are people that you report up to and talk with them about the, the importance of making sure that there is a baseline of alignment when it comes to the employee and the customer experience. If you can do that, then while you might have different leadership styles, there won't be this kind of um, space between the leadership team that individual employees or groups of employees can drive wedges between, and you're likely to have this cohesion that leads to support of each other as opposed to uh, one of your team being ousted by the rest. Yeah, I think it's a great woman to hack, and in, in what you're looking to discover here is that if you have standouts in any one of those four categories, if you're like, oh my gosh, it's this person, then there's probably the Mr. Glass, for those of you that are uh, fans of Unbreakable, the opposites uh, of somebody else on the team, potentially. That's uh, that's kind of the other side of that. So when you have those big standouts and those, those um, individuals that really stand strong in those four things – Chances are there's somebody else who doesn't, and and that uh, that 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 delta between the two in a lot of teams is how people will look at the larger team, and then by default how they will start to define different leaders, and then by default you'll have a leader who may not 
uh, be able to, you know, that, that may be on their own kind of or may end up, you know, especially like the one when it comes to accountability. If you have a standout leader that you're like, oh, this person, like number one in accountability, they might be the common enemy if other people fill in the other three um, or if there's nobody next to them or close enough to them in their output of behaviors to make sure that the team understands that we are consistent across the board. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is all about contrasting. Every person, just the, the human human nature is that we judge things in the context of how they vary from what we think a, a baseline is or, or what is available. It's why it's why people think they got a good deal on a car if they know other people who paid more. That has nothing to do with what they actually paid. It's why it's why no one thinks that I don't want to say no one is a it's a generalization, but it's why a lot of people don't think they're not being paid enough until they find other people who are being paid more. Then all of a sudden they're not being paid enough. It's it's the context of what is my experience versus the experience of others. Because if the experience amongst everybody is the same or really similar, it's less likely to, to cause problems or or that, that delta between the two is less likely to be called out. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Your Leadership, a Speaker Prime podcast. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time. 